Good morning and welcome to Light Reflections from First Friends. We are glad you have chosen to join us for this virtual worship service and hope you find it beneficial to your spiritual journey. We consider this an abbreviated version of our in-person meeting for worship for those wishing to join us from a distance. If this is your first time joining us, First Friends is a thriving, progressive Quaker meeting in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. We consider ourselves a loving, inclusive, joyous gathering of people seeking to know truth under the leadership of God's Spirit. All are welcome, no matter race, age, cultural background, sexual orientation and identity, marital status, physical and mental ability, family structure, or economic circumstance. Our hope is that through this worship experience, you will discover our faith community is unlike any other, where silent meditation is as important as the spoken word, where we emphasize the importance of one's personal encounter with the divine, and where we seek to support one another as we discover truth together. Now we invite you to center down and enter this virtual worship space with us.
Good morning, friends, and welcome to Light Reflections. Today is Graduate Sunday, and we are honored to celebrate the graduations of several people within our community. We will start with high school graduates. Logan K. Logan is graduating summa cum laude from Fishers High School. He plans to attend Purdue University in the fall and looks to major in engineering with an interest in computer engineering. Logan says this, I've been attending First Friends pretty much my whole life. And I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who helped make memories like the Philadelphia trip, all the youth group outings and activities at the summer picnic so much fun and helping to make First Friends a special place. Lewis Henry. Lewis is graduating with academic honors from Fishers High School. He plans to attend Indiana University in the fall and looks to major in nursing or some other medical field. Lewis says, one of my favorite memories of First Friends was going on the affirmation trip to Philadelphia. I enjoyed seeing the historical and colonial sites and learning about Quaker and American history. I'm grateful for all the experiences I've had while at First Friends. And now for our college graduate, First Friends organist Wolf Von Roos. Wolf will be graduating from Ball State University with two degrees, a Bachelor of the Science of Music and Bachelor of Music Performance in Organ and Secondary in Jazz Guitar. Here's a little of Wolf's story. He says, My story begins when I was just a baby at the age of two. At that time, my father was the priest of an Episcopal parish in Vincennes, Indiana, and during that time we lived in the parish house or the rectory directly connected to the church. My room was located directly across from the sanctuary, blocked by a wall, and the organ was right next to my crib. The very first organ composer I heard was none other than Joseph Reinberger. Fast forward to five years old. I asked my dad if I could play the organ. He said sure, and the organ was a rare 100-year-old Steer and Turner tracker pipe organ that resembled the English Romantic style. I had no idea what that thing was, and I was afraid it was going to growl at me. <laughs> to my dad's surprise, he and the secretary caught me playing J.S. Box, Yezu Joy of Man's Desiring, Six years old, I played my very first cathedral organ, and when my mom was getting her second master's degree from St. Bernard Arch Abbey in theology school, I often wandered against my mom's wishes and always hung out in the Arch Abbey right next to the organ. I just stared at it and the pipes in awe of its fire color until the organist walked in and let me doodle with him. What made me smile was the pedal 32 foot pipes with full organ, but I also found myself drifting with its soft and lush sounds. There's more to this part, but that place and organ hold a special place in my heart and officially lit my spark of music. Not to mention it was a 10 minute drive to Holiday World. <laughs> Finally, my story ends with my first concert. My elementary school let me take a day off to go to an organ concert at my current home church, Christ Church Cathedral in Indianapolis. My grandparents always took me to church here when we visited them, and I fell in love with, with their not one, but two pipe organs, especially the organ in the front of the church. The concert I attended was performed by Douglas Cleveland, and this was back when Dr. Burgomaster and David Sinden were the music people there. I think there was also a couple of women who played the organs too with them, but I can't remember. I know my path was music when I heard Mr. Cleveland unleash the beast of the cathedral's chancel organ. Well, fast forward, my first lessons were officially in high school, and the rest is history. Here I am today, a Sparkle Shoes concert performer, an artist in residence, a future performer, professor of this instrument, and scholar who loves to study its music. Wolf's future plans are to continue his career and path as a concert musician. In due time, he'd like to hopefully land a position in a cathedral church. Eventually, he would like to continue his education and receive a master's in organ performance and doctor of music. He would love to become a professor of music at a university. Now for our advanced degree graduates, Jill Frame. Jill has the good fortune of celebrating two graduations this May. 
The first is for a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from Christian Theological Seminary here in Indianapolis. And the second is a master's of divinity from Earlham School of Religion. Jill says, my academic pursuits led me to the Quaker tradition, which also led me here to First Friends. I'm grateful that my family is part of this meeting and the Quaker faith community. My experience here at ESR have helped to galvanize my own theology, giving me valuable confidence and grounding which I draw upon each day as I work as a therapist. Upon graduation, I will continue to build my therapy practice. And finally, Maggie Crawford. Maggie will be graduating from Boston University with a master's in marketing. Maggie is the daughter of Janice and Wayne Crawford and has attended First Friends since birth. She will be traveling to London at the end of May to finish her degree there through Boston University where she will have an internship creating the marketing for a bakery called Butter and Crust. When she returns to the U.S. in August, she hopes to work for an agency where she can make a real impact on societal views. She wants to travel the world and see how others live and thrive. She went on several mission trips with First Friends, one to New Orleans and another to the Dominican Republic. And her favorite memory of First Friends is running around with the youth group and playing hide and seek and sardines. She would like to thank her family for all their support. Congratulations to all of our graduates. We, will you join me now as I pray for our graduates? Dear God, thank you for the knowledge these graduates learned in school, for the successes and the failures that have taught them how to succeed, for friendships gained, for the support of understanding parents, families, and teachers, for the gift of self-knowledge. Lord, give them the strength to be vulnerable, the courage to care, and the wisdom to love. Amen. Also on this Sunday, we want to recognize all of those who served in a teaching capacity at First Friends over the last school year. We've had an amazing group of teachers who bless our children and adults. Let me begin by honoring all of those who helped with our children's worship. Tiffany Beaver, Ruth Kelly, Barbara Keyes, who directed our children's choir, Rick and Linda Lineback, Maya and Andy Cunningham, Beth and Lucy Kay, Janice Crawford, Beth Ferris and Sylvie Small, Chrissy Summer, Beth Hendricks. Thank you all for your dedication. Also each week we have a dedicated group of individuals who serve our meeting by providing children's messages. We want to thank Sue Henry, Mary Henderson, Chrissy Summer, Jim Carthal, Susan Raines, Beth Hendricks, and Carrie Sample. Thank you for making our children feel part of worship. For several years now, Aaron and Michelle Thornburg have led our youth ministry, engaging our youth with fun activities and opportunities for spiritual growth. Thank you to Aaron and Michelle for working with our youth. Each week I have the privilege to work directly with Eric Baker, our music and choir director. Eric is a blessing to our meeting and to our choir. Thank you, Eric, for leading us and supporting us in so many ways with your musical giftings. Lastly, Beth Henricks and I have the opportunity to lead two groups that help those seeking a deeper journey with Quakerism. Each Sunday, I facilitate a wonderful group of individuals who, call, who are called Seeking Friends. And Beth has now led two affirmation classes for First Friends, with plans for another in the fall. We are grateful for their, these opportunities and are blessed by all we learn from each of you. Thank you to everyone who makes First Friends a place to learn and grow. You are a blessing. Our scripture for this morning comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 8 to 11, and I'll be reading it from the message version. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into full formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way producing with us great praise to God. 
At this time of year, I find myself reflecting and reminiscing about my own graduation ceremonies over the years. My high school graduation was held outside Zollner Stadium in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The graduates sat in full sun in the same place where the Zollner Pistons, who became the Detroit Pistons, played professional basketball outdoors back in the day. We moved back to this location at the last minute after a brief storm came up, which made it miserably hot in the sun. Most of what I remember is sweating a lot. <laughs> I also had to leave immediately after my graduation party that day to get to the camp where I was to become a camp counselor. The same camp where one year later, I would meet my wife, Sue. My undergraduate college commencement was at Concordia University in River Forest, Illinois. It was interesting as well. Our commencement speaker was the mayor of Gary, Indiana. Oh, they went all out. He had graduated from my college and was doing some great work in cleaning up the city of Gary. Earlier, when I started college, I remember watching on the news military tanks being moved into downtown Gary as the violence in the town had escalated. Things have changed immensely in Gary since that day, greatly due to my commencement speaker. When I received my master's degree, we were all lined up in the basement of the library at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, awaiting our processional. And our commencement speaker had been kept a secret until he arrived to greet us all in that basement. Later, we found out this was mostly due to his controversial status with people at the time. But it came as a surprise as the political advisor to Richard Nixon, Chuck Colson, made his way through the graduates, shaking our hands and looking for a table to sit at to cut down his message. See, he was told he had 15 minutes, but his speech was almost 40 minutes. I was standing nearby as he argued why he deserved more time. It was really awkward. Well, my doctoral hooding ceremony with George Fox Evangelical Seminary in Oregon was probably the most beautiful of my graduation experiences. Our speaker was one of my professors, Len Sweet, who not only challenged us, but spoke a charge to us to step up to the challenges of our world with being like Christ. My family, along with many from my Quaker meeting, came to celebrate the occasion in Beaverton, Oregon, and it was a beautiful and memorable event. Well, over the years, I've often thought I, what I would say if I was asked to give a commencement speech, and immediately my mind goes to the many commencement speeches that have lived on after they have been given, such as Chadwick Boseman's speech at Howard University in 2018 when he said, purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at this particular time in history. Or there was Steve Jobs' speech at Stanford University in 2005, where he said, your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you're doing. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Or how about the speech Oprah Winfrey gave at Harvard in 2013, where she said, learn from every mistake because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes are there to teach you and force you into being more who you are. And then figure out what is the next right move. And the key to life is to develop an internal, moral, emotional GPS that can tell you which way to go. Or one last one from David Foster Wallace, speaking at Kenyon College in 2005, where he said the really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and being able to truly care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad petty, unsexy ways every day. That is real freedom. That is being educated. These were all in the top 15 of all time commencement speeches in history, but the one that I believe speaks to our condition, whether graduating or not, and continues to make the list of the top commencement speeches is from Naropa University in 2015, where Quaker Parker Palmer gave the commencement address. Many consider it the best commencement speech ever given. This morning, I want to share some of Parker's words. These are not words just for those graduating. These are pieces of immense wisdom that we can all take with us and work to develop in our daily lives. Palmer labeled them the six advices for living with wholeheartedness. He starts by saying this. He says, be reckless when it comes to affairs of the heart. 
What I really mean is be passionate, fall madly in love with life. Be passionate about some part of the natural and or human worlds and take risks on its behalf, no matter how vulnerable they make you. No one ever died saying, I'm sure glad for the self-centered, self-serving, and self-protective life I lived. He goes on to say, offer yourself to the world, your energies, your gifts, your visions, your heart, with open-hearted generosity. But understanding that when you live that way, you will soon learn how little you know and how easy it is to fail. To grow in love and service, you, I, all of us must value ignorance as much as knowledge and failure as much as success. Clinging to what you already know and do well is the path to an unlived life. So cultivate the beginner's mind, walk straight into your not knowing, and take the risk of failing and falling again and again, then getting up again and again to learn. That's the path to a life lived large in service of love, truth, and justice. Palmer's second point of advice speaks to the difficult art of living with opposite truths and speaks of inner wholeness. Palmer says this, as you integrate ignorance and failure into your knowledge and success, do the same with all the alien parts of yourself. Take everything that's bright and beautiful in you and introduce it to the shadow side of yourself. Let your altruism meet your egotism. Let your generosity meet your greed. Let your joy meet your grief. Everyone has a shadow. But when you're able to say, I'm all of the above, my shadow as well as my light, the shadow's power is put in service of the good. Wholeness is the goal, but wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of your life. As a person who has made who made three deep dives into depression along the way. I do not speak lightly of this. I simply know that it is true. As you acknowledge and embrace all that you are, you give yourself a gift that will benefit the rest of us as well. Our world is in desperate need of leaders who live what Socrates called an examined life. In critical areas like politics, religion, business, in the mass media, too many leaders refuse to name and claim their shadows because they don't want to look weak. With shadows that go unexamined and unchecked, they use power heedlessly in ways that harm countless people and undermine public trust in our major institutions. In Palmer's third piece of advice, he calls for extending this cur cur courtesy to others and treating them with the same kindness that we do our own. As you welcome whatever you find alien within yourself, extend that same welcome to whatever you find alien in our outer world. I don't know any virtue more important in these days than hospitality to the stranger, to those we perceive as other than us. The old majority in this society, people who look like me, in on its way, is on its way out. By 2045, the majority of Americans will be people of color. Many in the old majority fear that fact, and their fear, shamelessly manipulated by too many politicians, is bringing us down. The renewal this nation needs will not come from people who are afraid of otherness in race, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation. Palmer's fourth piece of advice addresses the small-minded lists and unimaginative standards that measure all the wrong metrics of productivity and progress. Palmer urges Take on big jobs worth doing. Jobs like the spread of love and peace and justice. That means refusing to be seduced by our cultural obsession with being effective as measured by short-term results. We all want to work our work to make a difference. But if we take on the big jobs and our only measure of success is next quarter's bottom line, we'll end up disappointed, dropping out, and in despair. Our heroes take on impossible jobs and stay with them for the long haul because they live by a standard that trumps effectiveness. The name of that standard, I think, is faithfulness. Faithfulness to your gifts, faithfulness to your perceptions of the needs of the world, and faithfulness to offering your gifts to whatever needs are within your reach. The tighter we cling to the norm of effectiveness, the smaller the tasks we'll take on because they are the only ones that get short-term results. Care about being effective, of course, but care even more about being faithful to your calling and to the true needs of those entrusted to your care. 
You won't get the big jobs done in your lifetime. But if at the end of the day you can say, I was faithful, I think you'll be okay. In his fifth point of advice, Palmer echoes Tolstoy's letters to Gandhi on why we hurt each other and offers this. Since suffering as well as joy comes with being human, I urge you to remember this. Violence is what happens when we don't know what else to do with our suffering. Sometimes we aim that violence at ourselves, as in overwork that leads to burnout or worse. Or in the many forms of substance abuse, sometimes we aim that violence at other people. Racism, sexism, and homophobia often come from people trying to relieve their suffering by claiming superiority over others. The good news is that suffering can be transformed into something that brings life, not death. It happens every day. Parker says, I'm 76 years old. I now know many people who've suffered the loss of the dearest person in their lives. At first, they go into deep grief, certain that their lives will never again be worth living. But then they slowly awaken to the fact that not in spite of their loss, but because of it, they've become a bigger, more compassionate people with more capacity of heart to take in other people's sorrows and joys. These are brokenhearted people, but their hearts have been broken open rather than broken apart. So every day, exercise your heart by taking in life's little pains and joys. That kind of exercise will make your heart supple, the way a runner makes a muscle supple, so that when it breaks, and it surely will, it will break into a fragment grenade. But not into a fragment grenade, but into a greater capacity for love. In his sixth and final piece of wisdom, Palmer quotes the immortal words of St. Benedict, daily keep your death before your eyes. And he echoes Rilke's view of mortality by counseling. If you hold a healthy awareness of your own mortality, your eyes will be open to the grandeur and glory of life. And that will evoke all the virtues I've named, as well as those I haven't, such as hope, generosity, and gratitude. If the unexamined life is not worth living, it's equally true that the unlived life is not worth examining. Well, folks, what Parker Palmer was addressing was not just a set of graduates from Naropa University, but he's sharing wisdom with all of us, all of life in this present moment. This is timeless wisdom that I hope we take in and make part of our lives. I believe we all need this message today. And as Parker said, may our eyes be open to the grandeur and glory of life. Well, now as we center down and enter waiting worship, let us take a moment to ponder the following queries. Am I passionate and falling madly in love with this life? How might I introduce myself to my shadow side this week? In what ways do I need to work on embracing otherness? And how am I transforming my suffering into something that brings life?
We close this time of worship with a Quaker prayer. God, open our eyes and unstop our ears that we may see your light and may hear your heartbeat reflecting and resounding within our chests in those of all our neighbors near and far, in all creatures and plants and in the ground we walk upon. When we finally are able to yield to the leading of your rhythm and flow, may we come to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of you in all. Amen. Have a great week, friends.